Welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're starting again this fall online and we're going to have a good lineup of speakers. It's wonderful for the first talk this fall to have Melanie Wood. Melanie is very special. She was the first woman to be on the US International Olympiad team. That was four, 24 years ago. And then she studied with Manjul Bhargava at Princeton now as professor at Harvard, and she'll tell us about determining distributions of groups from their moments. This is a problem, an analog of which we are really familiar with in mathematics, but also in theoretical physics, where we try to reconstruct distributions of Schwinger functions or uh, quantum field theories from their Whiteman functions. And we're very interested to hear the generalization of the classical theory that Melanie's developed. So Melanie, the floor is yours. All right, uh, thank you, Arthur. Thank you for the nice introduction and the invitation uh, to speak to you guys today. Yeah, so um, let me share here. And um, I'm going to be, um, speaking about determining distributions of groups from their moments. And I'll try to have um, the chat window open, but if anyone has a question, also just feel free to, to speak up in case, uh, especially if I miss it. So um, let's just like to say that if you do ask a question, please turn on your video so we can see you. Yes, that would be, would be nice. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, as, Arthur said maybe you're also familiar with the um, uh, the classical question um, uh, of distributions of numbers. Uh, so the fact that distributions of numbers can be recognized by their moments. And just to make sure we're on the same page of what I mean by by this, I'll, I'll just give the sort of briefest review of what I mean by this. So um, it, the moments are indexed by natural numbers k, and the kth moment um, of some distribution is the average of uh, x to the k. So it's associated to a distribution. You might write it like this, where you integrate over some distribution, x taken from that distribution, x to the k, or if you're a probabilist, um, you might write it as an expected value. The expected value of x to the k, or this x is a random variable, you know, with some distribution. And so for every k, uh, for every k, of course, one can average such things or take, take the average of, such random variables and you get some number. I mean, if, I mean, maybe you get infinity or maybe this is not defined, <laughs> but if these, if these averages exist, you get some number um, uh, uh, M sub K and uh, we, some of the most familiar um, distributions, so maybe the first example, um, uh, the Gaussian distribution, uh, so let me move that line. Um, try to draw something that looks Gaussian. And I'll write this in the in this in this probability notation. Um, uh, so the moments here are easier if we actually center them. We subtract the 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 first moment, and then the moments of the Gaussian distribution are. Uh, zero when k is odd and then sigma k k minus one double factorial this is like the factorial but you you skip every other number when you're multiplying so these are are the moments of the Gaussian distribution and it's very useful um if you have a distribution that you would like to prove is a Gaussian for example if you're trying to prove the central limit here um how might you do that uh, uh you can can recognize that you have the Gaussian distribution uh, by, by the fact that it has these averages, maybe another 
A very classical example is a Poisson distribution. So that is a distribution not um, on real numbers, but uh, on a subset of those on, on positive integers. Um, so I'll also sort of put maybe dots to kind of remind us that it's a sort of different, different shaped distribution. And the easiest way to remember um, the moments of this distribution is to not take the moments themselves du directly, but take these uh, factorial moments um, and they are lambda decay where this is the Poisson parameter. Um, and since I'm interested in when knowing all the moments determines the distribution, these I consider to be, uh, oh, maybe I should, uh, this should have k terms. So I probably don't want to subtract k on that last one, but k minus one. So, um, so let me just remark that knowing these, both of these are just essentially renormalized kind of moments. So knowing these uh, is equivalent to knowing uh, the averages of x to the k, um, because of course you, you you expand this out and it's a polynomial of degree K and X to the K. So if you know all the lower averages, you can get the K one and kind of vi vi vice versa. Um, so the sort of classical sorts of theorems, uh, which I'll say is uniqueness of the moment problem tells us that when the moments don't grow too fast, don't grow too quickly, there is at most one distribution with those moments. It's it's, it's more subtle to actually say when there is one, the existence question. Um, and I'll just say that what is too fast, this is not too fast. It's okay for them to grow. Um, uh, I'll just use that same word that I use quickly. This is not too quickly. Exponentially is not too quickly, but um, uh, the exponential of a quadratic uh, is, it is too quick. There are multiple distributions um, that have moments of this, the, you know, the same moments of this order of magnitude. So just to give you a sense, like there's some, some room for, for them to grow, but not, um, not an order e to the k squared. And so why is this important? Maybe you have seen things like this in your own context. Um, like I said, it's one way, you know, one of the standard proofs of the, the central limit theorem, it recognizes that you get this Gaussian distribution in the limit uh, because uh, you can recognize its moments and then apply something like this. Um, but in general, this is really useful because moments are often more accessible than direct information about the distribution. And what, that's because of linearity of expectation, you can often, Sort of break down a moment into simpler pieces that you can understand. So, just sort of how the moral of this um, is moments, you know, are often you know more accessible than somehow just directly asking, well, what is the measure that this distribution assigns to some certain range of values? So, the moments are often more accessible, um, which makes this useful. So, this makes this useful. So that's just the, the tip of the iceberg of the very classical theory of um, moments and using them uh, to determine a distribution of numbers. And so now I want to turn to more the focus of 
uh, this talk, which is about not random numbers, but random groups, if you like the um, random variable language. So you could think of this, it's a random variable valued in something like the set of groups or the set of isomorphism classes of groups. Let me just, just clarify like which level we're on because you might have thought often, you know, maybe about a random element of a group, even when we were talking about a random real number, you could say that's a random element of a group. I'm not talking about a random element of a group. I'm talking about a random variable that is valued in groups, or if you prefer the distribution language, you know, or just think of a distribution or a measure, you know, on the set of, of groups or isomorphs and classes of groups. And um, I'm interested in such things and I would like to be able to do a similar kind of thing to recognize various, especially important distributions of groups uh, by some kind of averages or moments. Um, and so to talk about this, I think it makes sense to tell you a little bit where my motivation comes from um, and what kind of groups I'm thinking about. So here are some examples. Um, and I don't, you know, you don't have to maybe know all the technical details of the areas that these examples uh, come from, but I hope that it will give you the, the flavor, at least, of what, what kind of groups I'm thinking about. So the first example um, I want to talk about uh, comes from number theory. So I start with uh, a finite extension of the rational numbers. So you can think like, oh, Q join I, uh, or uh, Q join the cube root of two or something. So, so this is what we call the number field. And such a thing has uh, a, the class group, uh, which is a finite abelian group associated to the number field whose you know, original role and motivation is that it measures the failure of unique factorization in this extension, you know, in the extension K. So we know, so the class group of Q, uh, the class group of Q is trivial. Uh, it's, this is the, Trivial group, we know that the integers have unique factorization. Maybe I should say here, when I say unique factorization, you know, into primes. But that doesn't happen in more general um, number fields that everything has unique factorization into primes. Uh, things can have multiple factorizations uh, into irreducible elements that are genuinely distinct. And this class group is a finite abelian group that is measuring um, the failure of that. Uh, maybe perhaps most famous uh, historically, um, uh, Kumar uh, could show for Maslow's theorem uh, in the sort of case of x to the p plus y to the p equals z to the p, so having no non-trivial integral solutions when um, p did not divide the order of the class group of the extension you get where you, when you adjoin a p root of unity, so either the two to pi i over p, so this, when you join a P3 of unity, you get some finite extension that has some class group. And, oh, I was trying to write its order by putting bars around it here. So, um, so if the failure of unique factorization in these numbers, when you include a P3 of unity, didn't involve P in this certain way, uh, uh, then one could sort of factor 
you could maybe see why why this expression is nice to factor if you have a p root p roots of unity. Um, uh, and unfortunately, sometimes uh, p does divide the that class group, and so that doesn't always pr prove um, Fermat's left theorem. It's turned out to be quite a bit more complicated th than that in general. Um, but this is sort of historically one of the reasons that people got interested in class groups because certain arguments you could make nicely if you had unique factorization. And then if you don't, maybe you could try to understand the extent to which it breaks down and can you still make some of the arguments that you would like, like to make. Um, all right, so the kind of um, uh, group, sort of random group that I'm interested in here is sort of very simple. It, it's it when I take a random uh, K in some family. And so the, this family here might be, uh, you know, just kind of very straightforward. Like I take an integer up to some large X uniformly and I take, you know, Q adjoin the square root of that integer. Okay, so, but it could be most any kind of family, uh, then I get here a random, a random group, a random finite abelian group. And I'm interested in what the distribution of those groups look like. So how often, for example, do you get a group that, that um, you know, where say three divides its order, or how often do you get a cyclic group, or how often do you get what kind of group? All right. So that's my my first class of examples. Uh, my second class, so for me, it's very um, <laughs> analogous, but maybe um, more familiar if you come from different uh, parts of mathematical background. So here are the objects that we start with uh, is a three manifold. So a three dimensional um, uh, uh, three dimensional manifold, I'm thinking, in particular, uh, you know, no boundary compact or what they would call closed. Um, all right. So then you can think about other other types of three dimensional manifolds. It's not too different. All right. And here I'll just jump uh, to the group here. Um, I'm going to write it down here, uh, which is the fundamental group. Uh, I should give my three manifold the letter. Right. The fundamental group. of the manifold, uh, which, okay, I'll try to, you know, sort of, it's hard to draw a great picture of a three-dimensional manifold, but it's it's the group of loops in that three-dimensional manifold where the operation is concatenation. So maybe, you know, you do one loop and you follow another loop is how you um, uh, concatenate loops and have a the fundamental group of manifold. And so that's measuring the topology of the manifold, the holes, sort of the holes in the space. Um, and uh, similarly here, if you take in some way, and I'll talk about a cool way to do this later in the talk, but if you take a random uh, three manifold, uh, then you sort of go down here and you get a random group. Now these groups, are a little more exciting as groups potentially because they're not abelian. They don't have, to, I mean, they could be abelian, but they don't have to be, they, don't, they could be infinite. Um, but I, so I should point out, there's actually a very deep analogy uh, between um, number fields and three manifolds that comes from the fact that the atomic homology of number fields uh, um, satisfies the kind of analog of a Poincaré duality, a three-dimensional Poincaré duality. So there's like a, a very strong analogy here. Um, and then in uh, this in this analogy, the thing that is analogous to the class group um, is the abelianization of this fundamental group, which is the first homology group. And there's actually something uh, over here that's anal analogous to the fundamental group, which is the Gawa group of the maximal unramified extension of the number field. And actually, it's also literally, you can call it an algebraic 
fundamental group. So this is, this is like a tau fundamental group of the this the scheme spec OK associated to the number field. It doesn't really what, matter what that is, but I'm just saying that even though these things seem very different, there is a strong analogy in which this fund there, the, this fundamental group. Um, is analogous to a certain Galois group on this side, and the class group is like the H1 of the class group being also the abelianization of this um, uh, possibly non abelian group. Um, and so on um, both sides of this, uh, on both sides of this analogy, one gets groups. And you could, you know, you could ask, you could be asking for the full non abelian random group, or maybe you, or you want to start thinking just about the abelianization, or maybe you could do even something simpler, like take the abelianization and then take it mod P. That would be like taking, you know, uh, FP or Z mod PZ coefficients in your homology, so with coefficients in uh, the finite field of order P, and then you could do a similar thing over here, which would just be to take the class group mod P times the class group. And so this is just some simpler little piece of it here. You're just seeing some, so some piece. All right, so these are the kind of distributions of groups that, the, that I'm thinking of and that this theory that I'll talk about is sort of built, built to handle. Um, uh, but it will be more general than that. It won't, the, the theory of the MoMA problem won't refer to the fact that the groups came from number theory or topology. I just wanted to give you a feel um, for the kinds of random groups I'm imagining when I think about this. So are there any questions about that? Okay, so, um, now, um, I want to talk about uh, some sort of history of this sort of problem. So Heath Brown um, in 94 was actually, um, investigating something that's pretty close to one of these kinds of class group things, but it's actually some other, so it's a sort of two summer groups of certain elliptic curves. So it's some other, um, other finite abelian group uh, that occurs in number theory. So for whatever reason, he was getting some, uh, some finite abelian group and then uh, Fouvry and Kluners in 2006. So they were uh, actually studying some piece of these class groups um, as k varies over certain number of fields, quadratic fields. Okay, so in both cases, there's some group and the that, that these authors were studying. So they were both studying uh, things that were groups, but they were rather particular kinds of groups. They are F2 vector spaces, okay? So they were studying distributions on, so they were exponent two abelian groups, F2 <laughs> vector spaces. Now, of course, when your group is an F2 vector space, it's determined by its dimension. Uh, so I maybe should say finite dimensional. Okay, they're studying distributions and on and again here, I'm not talking about a distribution on a particular vector space, but what you get is a vector that's varying. You get like a vector space. Uh, you know, so this is this is like the zero-dimensional vector space, the one-dimensional vector space, the two-dimensional vector space, right? They're getting one of these vector spaces. And so when you're doing such a thing, you might not even recognize it as a distribution of groups because you could. Just think of it as a distribution on the natural numbers. Um, so for, in particular, you could treat the vector space that you get just by, uh, as just being a number, say, given by its size. Um, and uh, 
In both cases, the authors found uh, the moments um, of the, the size of the vector space. So i.e. the averages of b to the k. Um, and there was a there was a conjectural distribution that they were trying to um, to show that these groups arising in number theory agreed with some conjectural distribution. There was a conjectural distribution um, uh, with moments uh, known that matched, but it turned out in these cases that. Uh, that the moments was like were on the order of um, were on the order of two to the k squared, which, like I mentioned before, was is a little bit too big to um, to use the classical theorems of probability to say that oh, just because I match the moments of my conjectural distribution, I know that I'm equal to it. Uh, however. These distributions are special because, well, while you can treat this the uh, vector space just as its size when you have a finite dimensional F2 vector space, of course, that's not the same as having a random real number. It's much more structured than that. You know it's some power of two. So you might expect that you can do better than just the general theory for when you can identify a distribution of real numbers from its moments, because now you're just trying to recognize the distribution on powers of two. And in fact, that's what the authors did in both cases. Uh, they proved new theorems that moments um, determine the distribution for their cases. Um, but mostly thinking about these, I think, as distributions on powers of two. Uh, however, as soon as you get into even slightly more exciting groups, even a billion two groups where you don't require them to be F2 vector spaces, groups are no longer determined by a number that's their size. There can be many groups of the same order. Uh, so we need uh, a more, um, uh, more general uh, theory to, to uh, average something about groups that isn't just their size. So one, what has turned out to work very well, so in this case, when you take the k power of the size of an of a F2 vector space, it turns out it's also equal to the number of homomorphisms um, from V in to F2 to the K, All right? So that's not so hard to see, right? If V is F2 to the D, then, you know, uh, the size of V to the K is two to the DK. And that's also the number of homomorphisms from V into F2 to the K, just choose where each basis vector goes. Um, and so, but you know, this uh, this kind of structure recognizes the group structure of V and turns out to be the thing uh, that that generalizes uh, quite well. So um, let's say let's see. order theory of moments of random we'll say we can think about finite groups um but there'll be a little pro in there I'll, I'll say say what i mean by that so the moments whereas before for a real number the moments were indexed by some natural number k here the moments are indexed by finite groups groups instead of natural numbers, 
And so we view this as the group that is indexing uh, those numbers. The, but I'll just say the moments themselves are still averages. They're still numbers. The moments, you know, are still real numbers. And so the G moment. Um, is the average, say, number of homomorphisms. So this is the G moment of X. So X is some random group. Is the number of homomorphisms, say, into G. So we can see how these moments, which were the averages of V to the K, we reinterpreted that as, oh, I wrote, I just wrote how much of the number of homomorphisms here. Um, and I've, I've written the number of a set two different ways with these bars and then with this, 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 this pound sign here, but it, that indicates the same thing. So I'm counting how many group homomorphisms there are from my random object to some fixed object that is indexing uh, the moments, or if you prefer, um, or if you have, if you prefer the, the analysis notation, if you have mu, a measure on the set of groups, then you would write this average is, you know, just the integral uh, with respect to that, to that measure. Uh, so, Several, um, yeah, so some comments. So what these moments see are they see homomorphisms into finite groups. That's all they can see about your group. So of course, if your group is a random finite group, then uh, you, know, you can really see a lot of it like this. Uh, and in general, even if you have infinite groups, but they have lots of finite quotients, uh, you can see a lot of information about the group. And literally what you see are all of the uh, finite quotients of, of groups. And that's the information given by the profinite completion of the group. And so that's what, you know, why I'm saying here that this is about profinite groups. So this theory of moments uh, is useful when you have profinite groups or you have groups that have lots of finite quotients. It's, this is not useful, and I hope, you know, if people have interest in this sort of question for groups that don't have a lot of finite quotients, um, then, you know, I hope that you'll be able to come up with, with some other theory for the kinds of groups in our examples. The number theory groups are, are literally um, uh, finite groups or pro-finite groups, and on the topology side, uh, those groups almost always uh, inject into their profinite completions so you can really uh, see the whole group through their finite quotient, you know, maps to maps to finite groups. All right. And that's not true for all sorts of groups. So this is very good. You know, this is, this is a, this, you know, theory works <laughs> for distributions on groups with you know, many finite quotients or maps to finite groups. All right. Um, and so, um, I'll uh, give, give an example sort of theorem. Uh, so this is a joint with my former student, uh, Wei Tong Wei. Uh, Okay, so if X and Y are random finite abelian groups, all right, so we'll start with not just F2 vector spaces anymore, but say finite abelian groups, still so not so scary in the world of groups. Um, uh, okay. Uh, and for each 
Vale. The number, the average number of homomorphisms from X to A is the same as, uh, oops, the average number of homomorphisms from Y to A. And these don't grow too fast. So we give in the paper a very you know, explicit formulation for what, uh, I don't grow too quickly what that is, but just in the interest of, of communicating the main ideas, I'll just say there's some bound. It's very, very similar to the, in spirit to the classical things, as long as these don't grow too quickly, then X and Y have the same distribution. Okay, so. Stepping back, I just have some, some distribution on finite abelian groups. And I'm saying I could ask, well, on you know, if I take a, a something random from distribu distribution and I ask on average, how many homomorphisms does it have to Z mod two? How many to Z mod three? How many to Z mod four? How many to Z mod two cross Z mod two? I ask this for every finite abelian group on average, how many homomorphisms does it have to it? Um, that, uh, as long as those numbers don't go too, too quickly, those characterize the distribution completely. Um, so. A question, do you have a necessary and sufficient condition on the growth? Ah, uh, yes, that's a, a good question. So um, yeah, the bound that we, we give um, uh, for the growth, there are counterexamples ju just, just beyond it. So close. I mean, there there may be some small range you could play around in there, but um, yeah, just beyond the the bound we give for growth, you can find um, uh, distributions with the different, genuinely different distributions with the same moments. And so one application. Um, of this, uh, for example, um, was in in my work with Yuan Liu and David Zurich Brown. Of course, these are like sort of, you know publication dates, <laughs> so. so. It's, it's a little funny that the ordering of things, but um, uh, in any case, so uh, this two, so two distributions of class groups in not the situation that I was talking about before, but in what's called the function field analog Uh, so that means that this Q at the beginning, the rational numbers that I started with and I took finite extensions of, um, uh, gets replaced by the field of rational functions. So these are rational functions over a finite field. And then I will also say sort of as Q goes to infinity. So uh, this is another sort of deep analogy in number theory that between number fields and, uh, and fields of rational uh, functions over a finite field. But in this analogy, one can use algebraic geometry over the finite field over FQ uh, to try to understand the problem. It's, a set of tools that we don't have available in the classical um, situation, say over the rational numbers. And then as Q goes to infinity, that algebraic geometry over the finite field or Q, in some sense, you can think of becoming more and more like algebraic geometry over the complex numbers. Uh, uh, and then we can use tools from, from that and from um, and topology to try to understand some things out of this, this situation. So um, 
So we applied a result like this to show um, uh, to show in this function field analog um, that some distribution of class groups matched uh, the conjectural distribution in this setting. So as q, q goes to infinity. Um, So in this uh, setting, like the setting I mentioned um, of the original work of Heath Brown and Kubri Kluners, there, there was a, a conjectural known distribution um, and it, we knew its moments. And so uh, a theorem like this turned, you know, turns understanding the distribution into to, you know, finding the moments and then and then you can apply this theorem. Um, and so the next thing I want to talk about, um, so is uh, joint work um, with Will Sawin. And it concerns the question, you know, what if you don't know an explicit distribution with the moments that you find. So you're working on some problem, some sort of distribution you're trying to understand and you are able to find its moments, but then there's not some conjecture, you know, there's not some known distribution with those moments. It's not like, oh, I recognize, like I have the Gaussian distribution, the Brousseau distribution, or the analog of that in the in the group world. So say you find some moments, but um, uh, but you don't know so, some explicit distribution with those moments. So we, um, our, our work, uh, we construct, and so this also handles the, the existence question of, okay, given a sequence of moments, does there exist a distribution? Now, of course, if you, if you found the moments from an explicit distribution, you already know the answer to the existence question. But um, uh, so we construct uh, a distribution uh, from, from moments. So this is in this context of random groups um, or show none exists. And this is still in this context up here of sort of when the uniqueness uh, would be true. So moments um, not uh, growing too quickly. Um, and so I'll just, I'll jump to uh, this first um, application. Uh, so this is in the three manifold setting. So the other kind of uh, 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 groups I was talking about. So this, so there's this Dunfield Thurston model of a random Haggard splitting. So this is a way to get a random three manifold, so a, a compact three manifold without boundary. Um, and they all arise this way. And this is uh, because every such three manifold has a, has a Hager splitting. Um, and so this is, this is how they describe it. So they say, here's a way that you can build yourself a random three manifold. You start, this is gonna be a genus three handle body. So you start with, a uh, genus G handle body. Actually, let's we start with two of them. <laughs> two genus. So this will be a picture in the case G equals three. And so when I'm drawing here, I'm when I say the handle body, it's this is a solid, these are solid three-dimensional manifolds. So not just the surface of the many whole donut, but like the whole donut you can bite into. Okay, three dimensional manifolds with boundary. All right, okay, so that that's a particular uh, 
three manifolds there with boundary. And we'd like to build a three manifold without boundary, just a genuine uh, compact three manifold. And the idea to do that is to glue the, uh-oh, to glue, say, the surface, you know, of this, uh, this three manifold to the surface of this one. So we're going to glue their surfaces. Um, we glue the surfaces together, and then you get a three manifold without boundary. Now, how do we glue the surfaces together? You could say start and just literally glue, you know, this point to this point, you know, every point to sort of the, with the identity map, the point that's in the same position. But actually, there are a lot of ways to map the surface of a genus G handle body, which is a genus G Riemann surface to another one. And those are given by the mapping class group of the surface. So how to glue, um, how to glue, the different ways that you might glue those surfaces are, um, together are the different ways that uh, you can map the, a genus G surface, the two-dimensional surface to itself. Um, different ways to glue are given by a group called the um, mapping class group. Mapping, oops, mapping class group of genus G. And so Dunfield and Thurston's model of a random Higgins splitting is that they first take a random walk in the mapping class group. So they are they can of some link that goes to infinity. So they get what feels like a very, you know, random element of the mapping class group. They can certainly reach every element uh, this way. And then to get all three manifolds, you can't just consider say genus three, like I did in my picture, you have to consider arbitrary genus. And so then they also let the genus go to infinity. And in this way, get, uh, well, not one distribution, but a se sequence of distributions that sees all, all compact three manifolds. Um, and so in this case, um, we uh, can compute, can compute the, the moments. So the average number, okay. And so let's say, I'll just, I'll just sort of call this M, the random three manifolds you get, uh, doing this and, and you know, imagine L and G are very large. So the expected number of homomorphisms from the fundamental group of this random three manifold into G for each G. Um, and uh, in my work with Will Sawin, uh, what we do is we, you know, use this theory, as I mentioned, um, where we build up a theory that constructs, constructs a distribution from the moments. So we didn't have some distribution that we expect on, on groups that we expected these fundamental groups to be in before. We really had no idea what it might be, um, uh, but we could compute the moments and then use our theory that showed that there would be a unique distribution with those moments, and in particular, that we could write it down and say what it was. So, um, uh, so, and then, and use our theory to write it down explicitly, to write down, you know, to write down the distribution that these may have come from. And okay, there are a lot of you know technical things you have to set up. So I'll just um, give one one sort of corollary. Um, so this is not the sort of way you write down the complete distribution. This is just one particular corollary you get from writing it down. That's that, that's concrete, so that you can see. So let S be a finite set of primes. 
Um, so the probability that pi one of this um, random Hager splitting, so this three manifold built in this way, um, has uh, no non-trivial S group quotients. Okay, so what's an S group quotient? It, that's a group, a finite group. An S group is a finite group whose order, it's like a P group, but you have more than one P. So a finite group whose order is a power, or is a product of, sorry, is a product of primes in S. Okay, so this is some particular thing. It, you know, first you start with knowing the average number of homomorphisms into every finite group. And then I'm telling you in particular from that, you could say, tell me the probability that there is no um, non-trivial quotient of this group whose order is a product of powers of two, three, and five, say, all right? Uh, and that, that, that probability is as follows. So it's the product over primes in S, the product of J greater than or equal to one. So you can see, I'm gonna write this down very explicitly. And really this product over the primes in S was a product over the finite simple S groups. So we're gonna have also a product over the non-abelian finite um, simple uh, S groups of E to the minus, this is the second group. This is the group homology. Uh, and this is the number of outer R morphisms of the group. So these are just some group theoretic quantities. So you see, um, this is sort of behaving like a, a Poisson kind of probability. And this is like a Q analog of a Poisson probability. Um, but in any case, that's some very particular um, uh, formula. And it's you know the kind of thing that you can then, then write down explicitly um, that comes from, from knowing the moments and then uh, using our theory to go from the moments to, to knowing entirely what the distribution is in terms of formulas. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. That was a really beautiful talk. And uh, maybe for discussion, uh, for the time I'll stop your screen share and see if people are interested to ask questions. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> it was such, touched so many bases. So maybe I just start out by asking, uh, is this Poisson distribution something like the Gaussian for the classical case, which comes up in many different forms in many different places? And is, ah, oh, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and so, yeah, is it, does it, so I think one of the, yeah, so one of the most important things say about the Gaussian distribution um, is the, its universality, this central limit theorem that tells you that you can start with kind of any old junk, uh, any kind of crazy distribution, let's just say with finite and variance or something, and then appropriately average those produce, you know, appropriately normalized at average, those always produce a Gaussian distribution. So this universality aspect. Um, and the kinds of distributions that arise from these very particular constructions with class groups of number fields, uh, it turns out that they uh, do have this kind of universality property that they can be shown to be um, the limits of distributions that are built from uh, kind of just whatever random, uh, uh, what, whatever uh, random distributions you, you, you start with in some kind of great generality um, in a way that's kind of analogous to the central limit theorem. And so I should say, so th that is known 
uh, by some work of mine in the case for abelian groups and some joint work with Hoi Gwyn as well um, for abelian groups. And just this summer, um, uh, a, a student uh, has been uh, working with me, uh, Elia um, Gorkowski has been working with me and he has shown the first kind of universality for non-abelian random groups. He shows up for some random nilpotent groups, um, but, but non-abelian. So I think that's, that's a, it's a very exciting direction. I think that the answer is yes. I think that we're gonna see that the kinds of, these kinds of distributions have, have universality properties and are gonna show up a lot of places, but, but this is early days of those explorations. So let me try another question. Um, is there a generalization, do you think, where you can go to an algebra, like a C-star algebra rather than a group? And uh... Uh, Yes, yeah. So actually, that's a great question. So, um, so Will, someone and I are, hopefully we'll be able to post this paper soon. We have um, our, our nearing completion of a paper about understanding um, uh, random objects in certain kinds of categories. Um, and the, um, the conditions you need on your category, first of all, there's something like the second isomorphism theorem or the um, diamond isomorphism theorem for, uh, for groups. So it's that's satisfied in huge generality um, by basically any time you have a category where you have some set of things and you have some operations that have to satisfy some relations like you know groups or algebras or modules or um, but then the other feature of our theory is that it works for these kind of finite or profinite objects, objects that can be understood through their finite quotients. So you need, those are sort of the two, the two, uh, really the only two features you need of, um, of the category, this kind of second isomorphism theorem, which is like I said, something that holds very generally for all kinds of things, certainly any algebraic thing, but also this thing that, um, you're at profinite in nature, meaning that the information can really be detected through finite quotients. And so um, I think for this kind of C star algebras, that to me seems, that second thing seems to be the, the thing that wouldn't quite, quite work depending on what your, your um, question is. But yeah, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of room to, to build this theory in different directions. Maybe I should ask if there are questions from other people. Oh, oh hi, Melanie. I have a quick question. So, uh, sometimes um, we always assume the uh, limit of the expectation of the cardinality of the surjective homomorphism. But sometimes I remember we also. Uh, assume the size of the homomorphism instead of the subjective ones. The question is that uh, do the, do the uh, conclusion differ a lot? Yeah, yeah, so um, here, let me just make sure I understand. You're talk, you know, here today I talked about the number of homomorphisms and you're asking about the difference when we were talking about the number of subjective homomorphisms, yeah. is that yeah. right? Yeah, okay, let yeah. me, um, I, I'll just, uh, briefly share my screen because I think if I write something that will be um, yeah clear. So if you've seen this before, you see other talks. Instead of this number of homomorphisms, you might see um, the number of surjective homomorphisms. Um, uh, and so this analogy that. Or these are sort of related notions and they're basically exactly like the difference between asking 
for the genuine cake moments and then these sort of folly moments because on the one hand, if you have if you have a number of homomorphisms, it, it's always every homomorphism is a subjective homomorphism to some group, subgroup. So it's just the sum over the subgroups of the number of uh, subjective homomorphisms to that subgroup. So you, if you if you know the average number of subjections, and this is a finite sum because G is a finite group. So if you know the number of subjections to each H, then you would know the average number of homomorphisms to G. And similarly, by sort of an inclusion exclusion, you know, or Mobius inversion, you know, uh, uh, similarly, you can get the number of subjective homomorphisms to G is some uh, with some sort of Mobius coefficients, um, just like, yeah, like it, inclusion and exclusion, you can get that in terms of the number of, of homomorphisms to each subgroup. Um, and so just, just in this way, um, we just pick one of these based on whether the numbers are more convenient. And in fact, actually, the numbers are almost always more convenient over here, um, but it's perhaps, a little quicker to explain on this side, but it's essentially just like a you know a change of variable. Um, there's no real difference uh, between using these as the moments and and these as the moments. So is is there a Gaussian on the other side? Um, the Poisson distribution on the left. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I guess the the so. The it's more like these distributions are more like Poisson distributions in the sense that these are the moments that are nicer. And I suppose for a Gaussian, it's like these are the moments that are nicer. And uh, in that sense, <laughs> at that level of, of philosophy, I you would say that these distributions of groups that we're seeing are more like Poisson distributions. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Are there other questions? Klaus, you have a question. Yes, uh, so thank you, Arthur. Uh, nice talk. So uh, are there any kind of multivariate versions uh, of uh, these results? So you see, I'm thinking a little bit, so I'm coming from non-commutative probability theory and where we uh, replace random variables by operators or even go further, say that a random variable is uh, some uh, star homomorphism from uh, one unit H prime to another one. Of course, uh, then uh, uh, the natural questions are now also in your context. So a long list of questions. What is, uh, is there a law of large number? Is there other central limit theorems? Are there multivariate uh, versions? What is the notion of um, uh, of independence factorization uh, uh, rules? Yeah, uh, and uh, are there uh, large deviation principles or things like that? Or let's say, can one work out uh, the whole theory in the context of let's say uh, a family of uh, finite groups? Well, uh, the permutation groups. Yeah. So um, okay, there's a lot of great questions. So Warren, we are working with just. I mean, even though the objects themselves are groups with the classical theory of random variables. Um, so the notion of, you know, it's just that our random variables are valued, in, you know, in a set of isomorphs and classes of groups or of some other category. So, um, uh, so independence is really, you know, just the, the, the same, um, uh, as a as a classical notion of of independence, um, you ask about like multivariate versions. So in some sense, um, like I said, now that we're building this the the moment problem theory for a general category, that in some sense already bakes in the multivariate kind of question because you can have a category of pairs of groups or triples of groups or you know intuples of groups, and so. So since we're taking random objects, um, yeah, in a category, and for example, the category of 
you know, triples of, of finite groups is certainly a category that we can work in. And so, uh, yeah, that automatically builds in a kind of multivariate um, theory. Um, yeah, I think, um, uh, there, I mean, the questions about, you know, law of large numbers and deviation, I mean, I think those are all good questions that it's, it's not clear in all cases what exactly um, the analog should be. And um, I, we, you know, what I mentioned before about the kind of universality result, maybe I'll just say a little bit more what that is. Here's one way of building a random group. You could start with some fixed group, like a free group, something uh, that feels like it has a lot of potential to see a lot of things. And then you could take a quotient by some random elements of that group. And so now you are talking about using a random variable value in a group by the way these random elements, elements that you quotient by. And then when you do that, you get some random group. And the kinds of universality results that I was mentioning before are the ones that they say that in, in limits as uh, say the number of, of the size of your, your free group say is going to infinity, the limiting distribution that you get on those quotient groups is universal in the sense that it is independent from the distribution that you use to pick the relations. You could pick them from some really funky, crazy way. And as long as you're taking them independently, you get some universality in, in the limit. So that, that's the, this kind of universality, I would say, is the other main kind of piece of, of probabilistic work that has so far been, been done in this theory. And that's still in its in, infancy. So I think basically everything else you asked are, are good questions. And I think uh, things that I hope well, that we can think about and other people will think about in the future. So maybe I could ask one more question. Is the analytic condition connected with some property of an coefficients of an analytic function, the growth condition? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good, so your question is, is the, the criteria um, in terms of how, how quickly the moments are allowed to grow connected to sort of coefficients of some analytic function. So it very much in the early proofs for like for finite abelian groups and the kind of, I mentioned this result with Wei Tong Wang, um, it, it absolutely was. And that was how the, the proof went. Um, uh, this, uh the 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 this more, but the more general are more general results that are working in, in sort of more arbitrary categories have moved away from that and we don't see that so explicitly so i mean it, you could it could be somewhere in there but um but the the approach is less explicit in a way such that you don't you don't really see see those uh, those sort of bounds for the growth yeah as you know, it's coming up in, in, in coefficients of some function. Um, uh, but, but absolutely did in the sort of early versions for the abelian groups. And I, um, it's possible you could still dig something, something out if you thought about it in the right way. But that's a nice question, thank you. So are there other questions? Well, if not, I'd like to thank Melanie again for a really stimulating talk. And uh, it's great to hear about a field in its infancy. Thank you very much, Melanie. All right, thank you.